The Vauxhall Mocha was once a rather nondescript crossover, but with the latest version, it's had a radical redesign. It's also now available for the first time with an all-electric drivetrain, which changes the name to Mocha E. Is this the greenest Vauxhall crossover yet, or does it make a Mocha E of the brand? But before we answer that question, please don't forget to like this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel and comment. However, after that pun, we wouldn't be surprised if you didn't want to. Being a crossover, the Mocha E sits quite high. It's nine centimeters taller than the Vauxhall Corsa E, for example. Assuming you like crossovers, this is a competent visual interpretation of the genre. General consensus is that the new Mocha E design looks much better than the old one. The appearance is more rugged, bolder, and more contemporary. We think it's more assured design than the Corsa E. The comparison with the Corsa E is valid because despite the different looks, the motor and battery are the same, 136 horsepower and 50 kilowatt hours respectively. But if you've been watching our reviews for a while, you'll realize that pretty much all cars from the Solantis group have this drivetrain, including those from Vauxhall, Citroen, and Peugeot. The version we have here is the Elite Nav Premium. This is not quite the top version with a launch edition above this. The entry level model is the SE Nav Premium and there is a SRI Nav Premium. The SRI name would imply a faster engine but it's exactly the same as the other rooms. All cars come with satellite navigation, a decent set of safety features we will talk about later, panoramic rear parking camera and cruise control. The SRI Nav adds a bigger infotainment screen, rear USB connections, a bigger digital instrument cluster, some additional safety features including adaptive cruise control, heated front seats and steering wheel, front parking sensors and folding mirrors. Otherwise the changes are cosmetic. The Elite Nav has a similar package but with different cosmetic changes. The launch edition further adds advanced parking assistance, leather seats and yet further appearance alterations. The other difference between models is the wheels. The basic car has 16-inch silver alloys, the SRI and launch have 18-inch bicolor alloys and the elite 17-inch bicolor alloys we see here. The basic color is grey and white is 320 pounds, blue or black metallic are 550 pounds extra while the bright green we have here or red are 650 pounds extra. There are a few other cosmetic options like a black bonnet for £200 and contrasting roof colours for £300 but thankfully the options list is not a confusing mass of possibilities beyond this. The equipment level is decent enough already across the range. So allegedly this car has keyless entry and you're supposed to be able to do something like this to open it. It doesn't seem to, oh it actually worked this time but you can see it's not exactly reliable. But let's have a look inside anyway. If there's one thing we particularly prefer with the Mocha E compared to the Corsa E, it's the interior. It doesn't feel quite so budget oriented. The SE Nav Premium gets fabric and the SRI leather effect. The Elite we have here has a different color leather effect. Only the launch edition has actual leather. These seats are quite comfortable, if maybe a little bit firm. There's plenty of headroom, which is much better than the Corsa E because obviously it's a taller car. The seats and steering wheel are also heated with all trim levels above SE. However, electronic adjustment is not an option on any trim. This is entirely mechanical and only four-way adjustable with the SE trim on the passenger side. The driver's seat is six-way adjustable and so is the passenger seat on all trim levels above SE. You get a couple of cup holders in the middle here and there's a small cubby underneath the armrest, which is handy or army maybe. You get this cubby at the front, which is quite sizable, but actually not the right shape for a phone. You can see that doesn't really quite fit there. It's also not a Qi charger. In fact, that's a very, rather expensive 150 pound extra. You do get a single USB-A port at the back here, not USB-C, and then the 12 volt adapter as well. As we found with a lot of Stellantis cars, the glove compartment is tiny, and in fact, not actually large enough for the car's own documentation. So now we start to come to some of the drawbacks with this car. It may be bigger than a Corsa E, but you'll see it doesn't actually have very much knee room for rear passengers. These seats are comfortable enough, and there's a decent amount of, actually quite a lot of headroom, but you know, this, is, this seat is set up for me and I'm five foot 10. So imagine if somebody over six foot was driving the car, it's gonna be difficult for somebody uh, even of my average size to sit behind them. There is a middle seat, unlike some cars we've reviewed recently. However, you'll notice as usual, it's a bit thin and probably only good for a child uh, and not for a very long distance. It's also worth pointing out that it's not something that you can pull down and turn into an armrest when there's two passengers. So there's no kind of extras like um, cup holders for rear passengers either. There are at least two USB-A 
ports in the back for rear seat passengers. That's a feature of only trim levels above SE. This magazine area is only available with the SRI Elite and Launch Edition trims. So if you go for the SE, your kids aren't going to have anywhere to put their copies of V for Vendetta or whatever it is kids read these days. The two outer rear seats have Isofix points underneath these zips that you can use to attach a child car seat and you get them on the front passenger seat as well. So one thing you'll notice when you examine the mocker closely is that there's no actual way of opening the boot unless you have the keys. So you have to press this button on the key and then it opens and you can open it. And this takes us to the second big drawback with the Mocha E. This boot is 310 litres as standard, which is decent, but it's actually only one litre more than the Corsa E. Although you do actually get this space under here, which gives you an extra 11 litres. Now, if we take off the rear parcel shelf, which isn't that hard, I suppose, once you know how to do it, you can, of course, drop the rear seats down um, in the typical 40, 60 arrangement. And you'll see that this boot is fairly flat. However, the total you have here is actually only 1,060 litres, which, believe it or not, is actually less than the Corsa E. This is a bigger car with a smaller boot capacity. How on earth did Vauxhall do that? This car is basically, if you're familiar with Doctor Who, this is like Doctor Who's TARDIS turned inside out. It's actually larger on the outside than it is on the inside. Another thing we noticed is that if you actually happen to have the car on and people sitting inside it, you can't actually open the boot with that key. It doesn't work. Although virtually all these Stellantis cars have the same motor and battery, there is a little bit of variation in the range and performance. Now the range on this one is a bit lower than some it's just 201 miles WLTP with the 16 inch wheels and obviously that goes down a bit if you choose the bigger wheels and rims as this car is also part of a range with petrol and diesel versions you'll see that the front is entirely made up with all the gubbins for the electric motor um, this would have an engine in it if it was a petrol or diesel version that range is just about enough for longer journeys however it is starting to look a bit staid now we're getting more and more cars with 250 miles of range and more the range is helped by the fact that this car supports 100 kilowatt DC charging. If you use 100 kilowatt DC charging, you're able to recharge this car to 80% from 15% in 30 minutes. If you use AC 7 kilowatt charging, it's going to take more like seven and a half hours to get to 100% charge. Running costs are also fairly reasonable coming in at about 3.5p per mile with a typical 14p per kilowatt hour supply. So a lot of our readers ask about what the charging experience is like with these cars. So we're going to try charging this Mocha E with this BP Pulse system. So this BP Pulse charger allegedly offers 175 kilowatts. So you select the uh, this connections, it's got Chadmo here as well. So I've selected CCS, which means I don't have to pull out the CCS plug and plug it into the car, which um, is only just about long enough to reach. And it's plugged in. Now for the final trying to pay for it. Press start here. And what am I going to use? I'm going to use card payment. So I'm going to press start. It appears to be starting charging. Let's have a look at the dashboard and see how fast it's charging. You can see it's charging at 195 miles per hour. Let's do a little bit of maths. So this car has a 200 mile range and a 50 kilowatt hour battery, which means it's actually probably only charging about 50 kilowatts. So we've been told this is a 100 kilowatt charger. However, we only seem to be getting about 50. On the other hand, it, to be fair, this car was at about 69, 70% already when we plugged it in. So um, it could be at that point in the curve where it's dropped below the 100 kilowatt level that it uh, starts off at. So as we said earlier, we really prefer this interior to the Corsa E. Starting with the steering wheel, it's pretty standard. There is this slightly flat area at the bottom, but it's, it's pretty normal in terms of the, how the buttons are arranged. You get typical uh, media controls, uh, volume, the voice uh, system, um, changing source and um, tracks up and down on the right. On the left, you have the controls for the cruise control. All cars get cruise control. This one has adaptive cruise control. On the right, you get a stalk for windscreen wipers, and on the left is the one for lights and indicators. The button for the heated steering wheel is also found inexplicably in the middle of the cruise control. So the basic car gets a seven inch instrument cluster, 
whereas on all other cars you get this much wider 12 inch instrument cluster this is much nicer looking the um, the Corsa E only has the 7 inch option and you can see there's a lot more information on screen with this version we much prefer it even though the design is similarly uh, minimalist you you it just feels like there's a lot more going on there a lot more uh, useful um, stuff on the screen in particular the fact you have this big dial giving you information about the battery is really useful so these drive controls are familiar from some Stellantis cars, but not the Corsa E. The Corsa E has a kind of joystick. This has this kind of rocker. You rock forwards for reverse, backwards for drive. There's a separate button for, for the B mode. Um, you also get this button for, for the parking mode. Here is a rocker that lets you select between sport, normal, and eco modes. And here is the obligatory electronic parking brake, which is mostly useless, except for you can engage it um, instead of auto hold, because this car doesn't have auto hold, so you can leave it in drive, put this on, um, and to stop for stopping at traffic lights without actually having to put your foot on the brake the whole time. There are some extra buttons for toggling some of the driver assist functions, so this one looks like it might be for teleporting children in and out of the car, not quite sure what that does. You get a full set of discrete controls for the air conditioning. Now this is pretty much identical to the Corsa E, but we kind of like it. You know, you got, um, it's not zoned, but you know, you can uh, adjust heat um, and you can adjust um, the, the, the uh, fan speed quite easily without really having to uh, take your eyes off the road when you're driving. So let's talk about the infotainment screen. This is the 10 inch version. There is a seven inch version only in the SE model, um, but all models get sat nav, which is a good feature. This is um, a fairly basic looking sat nav. Um, you know, it's um, this kind of gray color in daytime, and if you switch it to um, nighttime, um, you'll see it goes a bit dark, but still reasonably visible. We've certainly seen implementations of this from Stellantis where the dark mode you can't see because the screen isn't quite so clear. Um, you get DAB radio as standard across all cars. Um, the, um, you can connect a phone. Now it's also possible to, um, to, to access um, Apple CarPlay um, and um, Android Auto and even Bluetooth streaming that's available on all cars. If you press this button, you get to see um, the energy flow in the car. You can um, see it's a touchscreen as well. So you can see statistics in terms of charge. Um, you can see, um, you can actually set a charge timer, kind of useful if you have a, um, a supply that varies with time. Um, if you go to this setting, you can actually change settings for the car, a fairly simple menu system, really e fairly easy to use um, and here's where you get some you can change some settings for safety uh, comfort modes here and finally this button here lets you add apps um, you know you can add connected apps that's where you set up the Apple CarPlay and Android Auto um, and obviously that takes you back to the energy app as well so not a not a terrible screen not brilliant but I think you know functional it's also worth mentioning that all cars have connected functions as well, which is nice because it's across the entire range. Overall, this is a fairly average car with head turning color options. The bulk and height of the Mocha E means it's not as fast as the Corsa E. The latter takes 7.6 seconds to hit 60 miles an hour, and this one is over a second slower. Both have a top speed of 93 miles per hour, which I'm not gonna demonstrate on this 10 miles per hour road. That said, around town, you probably won't notice that much difference. The Mocha E is obviously more of a cruiser than a cheeky chappy, which has always been the Corsa's image right back from when it was even called Nova. The handling is decidedly middle of the road, clearly aimed more at taking speed bumps in a decent way, rather than taking corners at speed. You don't feel the same compulsion to drive the Mocha E urgently as you do with the Corsa E. The bulk makes it feel planted at motorway speeds. However, in fact, once you're cornering, I would describe this car as a bit wallowy. It certainly doesn't corner on rails, more like on an inflatable bouncy castle. The brakes are decent enough though. So here we are accelerating, you can see, not terrible because it still has that EV torque at the low end but it doesn't really kind of have that kind of, oh, my face is gonna fly back through the back of my head that you get from some EVs. I certainly can't feel my blood pressure changing. So speaking of that lane assistance, as we hinted earlier, the basic safety inclusions of the Mocha E are extensive. As standard, you get driver drowsiness alert, forward collision alert at low speeds, and you also get 
automatic emergency city braking. There's cruise control and lane departure warning with lane keep assist. Another great inclusion is you don't just get rear parking sensors as standard, you also get a panoramic rear parking camera, which isn't quite as good as a 360 camera, but has a decent simulation of it. There's even speed sign recognition. It's noticed that we're in a 50 speed zone here. The SRI and Elite add adaptive cruise control, forward collision warnings at all speeds, and lane positioning assistance. That isn't quite auto steering, but it does give you a gentle nudge to keep you in lane, which we just noticed when we were driving down here. You get front parking sensors as well, plus blind spot detection. The launch edition just adds advanced park assist, which is a kind of automatic parking system. So this is a comprehensive selection, even for the basic car. It's great to see adaptive cruise control on most of the range. Also having that a reversing camera across the entire range is a particularly nice inclusion. Prices for the Mocha E start at just over £30,000. The SRI version is £32,500, whereas the Elite version is actually £355 less. The launch edition is actually only £60 more than the SRI, but only while stocks last. Our car, with its green colour option, is just a little shy of £33,000. Insurance groups range from 21E for the basic car through to 23E for the launch edition. Now, while you do get a good level of kit for £32,000 with the Mocha E, the VW ID3 Kia e Nero 2 long range and the basic version of the Hyundai Kona Electric all give you more range for similar money. Despite being slower, we still buy the Mocha E over the Corsa E, but if you have a little over £30,000 to spend on an EV, we'd probably go for the VW ID3. If you really insist on having that Stellantis drivetrain, we'd also suggest that the EC4 from Citroen is a more rounded configuration with that drivetrain. So let's just, to finish off, have a look at that reversing camera. So as you can see, you get a really good view of the road behind you, and as you go over bits of it, you can actually see, um, because it's picked up the curb there, which is pretty good, you get a kind of quasi 360. You're not actually seeing what's in front of you, but it's pretending I can see it. The Vauxhall Mocha E is definitely a flawed car. The fact that it's bigger than the Corsa E, but doesn't trumpet on boot space is a major downside. That said, we prefer the interior compared to the Corsa E, and on the outside, we actually find it quite endearing to look at. However, there are a number of other EV options with more range for similar money, even if they don't have quite as much kit as standard, such as the VW ID3, the Kia e Nero 2 long range, and the Hyundai Kona Electric. If you like the way this car looks, we wouldn't say don't buy it. However, we would also recommend you test drive some other options. Please don't forget to like this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel and comment.